the Tennis Club Holdings LLC, Tennis Club of Sarasota Holdings LLC. Um, I'd like to focus my limited time here today <clears throat> on the improper summary judgment as it relates to the tortious interference as well as the um, unfair and deceptive trade practices claims and rely on our brief briefs for the other claims. Uh, there is a fulsome record here that I'd like to walk the court through, um, at, but and that record does demonstrate ample uh, disputes of material fact that support uh, the claims that the club has made here. But first things first, I would like to start by addressing the appellee's failure to carry their initial burden under the summary judgment rule to, quote, cite particular parts of materials, including depositions. And that requirement under the rule uh, is that it must be at the time of filing. And so what we had here was a motion for summary judgment that referenced two depositions, one of which was taken on the same day as the summary judgment, the other a few days prior, for which there were no transcripts to cite to. So no particular parts of those materials were cited. <clears throat> and your honors, these are uh, material, there's material evidence inside of those depositions, some of which was referenced and some of which um, eventually did play out to be in those transcripts once they were filed. One was filed by uh, the appellees a few days later. Uh, however, they didn't amend their motion to provide the correct citations. So, and then the Mr. Other Daniel, yes, Mr. Because, Daniel, your opponent makes the case that the depositions were in the record by the time of the hearing and that the overview of the content and the of what was going to be argued was outlined in the motion. And the rule does allow, the, the trial court is, it, it's required to consider the materials that are cited in the motion, but it allows the trial court to consider anything else in the record. What, what went wrong with this? I mean, I, I, I understand your argument, I think, but I'm, I also think that it, okay, fine, so what? That's, the, it, the, the deposition yeah. transcripts are there. The trial judge was authorized by the rule to consider them. There wasn't any surprise or ambush because the argument was made that they were going to be relied on and filed when they were transcribed. We so, are, these are these are you know mandatory uh, portions of of the rule, and to say that you know all's well that ends well once that evidence gets into the record. Well, I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying words. is the the transcripts were foreshadowed in the argument, filed by the time of the hearing. And the rule authorizes, permits, doesn't require, but authorizes the trial court to consider whatever else was in the record that the trial court deemed appropriate. I, I'm troubled by how we're supposed to work around that. Well, I, Your Honor, um, you know, what happened here as well uh, is that we had some partial references to part of the Cammie Longenecker deposition, but some pretty key testimony was left out of that motion for summary judgment that refutes their speculative argument that there could have been something else in due diligence on the horizon that possibly could have intervened to break causation. Um, and, and Kamen Ecker says in her testimony, which was not in the motion, um, which was not in the order before. Mr. Daniel, can I ask you where in the summary judgment motion hearing transcript would I find objections being made to the lack of sufficient um, record citations? Your Honor, there wasn't a specific objection uh, to this rule. However, there was, if you look at, um, let's see, it was page 42 of that hearing transcript. Um, there's a general discussion about um, the proposition that arguments that are outside of the motion um, yeah. you know, are not appropriate to be heard uh, at, at the hearing. Um, that's page 2,191 of the uh, supplemental transcript. Um, again, that was a general statement, <clears throat> so there wasn't a specific objection here. Um, but I, I'd like to turn now to, it, again, with my remaining time, to discuss all the evidence that wasn't addressed below, that we did put in to evidence eventually. Um, and, and I'll start with the Taylor Morrison deal and the evidence of that. Um, and I'm, I'd like to walk the court through that evidence. Uh, and recall, the elements for tortious interference, the first two we don't have a dispute over, there was a business relationship uh, and the HOA did know about it. But what we're disputing, what we have disputes over here are the causation 
of the unjustified interference and whether the methods that the HOA used uh, and, and the justification they gave exercising the right of first review rule are justifiable. Uh, and so those are the two, the two issues. Uh, and the first, I'll go through causation for Taylor Morrison. So the first, we have evidence that, uh, right, there was a waiver on October 13th, 2017 of the right of first refusal. That's an important date, and we'll get to it when we discuss the unjustified methods. After that, on the 1st of November, there's text messages between Taylor Morrison's broker, uh, or Taylor Morrison's agent, and the principal of the club saying it's going very good and and the principal says with the hoa the rapport is very strong see we seem very positive about it text messages not in the motion for summary judgment not in the summary judgment order <clears throat> then we have what's been referred to by a member of the board of the homeowner association as a very negative letter this was the letter revoking the prior right of first refusal claiming to be surprised by an extension of time, which again, the evidence showed they knew about uh, and there are text messages showing that in the record that weren't addressed below. Um, so we have the revocation on the sixth of the right of first refusal, also insinuating or suggesting that there are deed restrictions on residential use. Again, deed restrictions that the board knew, there's emails, and there was a report prepared 18 months prior that showed they knew residential use was not restricted. So again, misrepresentations in this letter. Then we have a call. Defendant Gerritsen testifies in her deposition. There was a call from Taylor Morrison's representative uh, asking about waiving those deed restrictions. Uh, and this was just after the very negative letter was sent. Uh, and Gerritsen says, you know, I can't speak for the whole board, but I would say no. Again, she knows there's emails from defendant Gerritsen. Those deed restrictions don't exist. So she's fabricating here. All right. Then we have a deposit. We have a temporary injunction motion filed the day after the very negative. I muted myself, your honors. I apologize. That's okay. That's okay. Actually, that's a good pause for me to, to ask you a question about that because throughout your brief, you keep trying to tie in the separate ongoing litigation uh, as, you know, there's a, they filed a motion, they heated up the litigation as, um, I guess you're, you're trying to marshal that as evidence of tortious interference or, or FDUPA violation. Can you cite any case where a court has, in Florida or anywhere, has ever held that heating up or engaging in parallel ancillary in litigation is itself a form of tortious interference or, don't, or violation don't have of a case that uh, specifically addresses just that alone. But remember, this happens the day after we have the letter. I, I, I got right? the timing. It's, it's a, I got it's the timing. circumstances, correct. We don't have a, a specific case discussing um, you know, specific litigation. And that, that kind of, that kind of, that kind of fits in the larger framework that, that I'm struggling with. And maybe you can help me. Um, I, I know you, you're reciting a bunch of facts that you've laid out in your brief that's in the record that we've looked at. Um, but the, the, the framework of all of this, I think is kind of summarized in the Ethel, in the Ethel Corp versus Balter case. It says, so long as improper means are not employed, activities taken to safeguard or promote one's own financial interests are entirely non-actionable. This case is a little bit unique in that you are working, this isn't um, a stranger um, homeowner association, if you will, that's that's trying to square a deal on you. They've got a con they've got a contractual right that, that, that they have that they have an interest in. They have a right of first refusal. And, Why and is it that play part of that contractual right in the justification? First of all, uh, the justification is not a per se bar. Just because a contractual right exists and you're doing something in furtherance of that, it's not a contractual bar, it's not a per se bar. Um, the cases, the insurance field services versus White out of the fifth DCA, Howard versus Murray out of the first DCA say this is, uh, you know, you have to consider all their circumstances. It's highly fact dependent. And so we look at the methods used to exercise that right. Recall that date I placed at the beginning. The, the right of first refusal was exercised on October 13th, 2017. After that, 
is when we have the group of five, defendant Garrison, beginning to discuss financing to exercise a right of first refusal they'd already waived. And they already knew that an extension had been granted, right? The, they knew that in September. We have text messages uh, supporting that, which weren't addressed below. So this is evidence of, yes, they had a right of first refusal. They exercised it. Then they had regret about exercising that. And now they're trying to figure out a way to walk that back. And they're trying to do it in a way that is not uh, sanctioned by the rules of the game, using falsehoods, representing that there are deed restrictions that don't exist, that they know don't exist, you know, being claiming surprise about an extension that they knew about. So yes, you have a justification, you have qualified privilege, but you have to exercise that pursuant to the rules of the game. And that's a fact question. Your honors, if I can turn to the Robert Mitchell deal, and I'll, and I'll go through some of that because the Robert Mitchell deal, um, there was a lot of evidence that wasn't addressed there. Uh, the only evidence that really was addressed below was the letter from Mitchell's counsel um, backing out. And the only portions of that that are addressed are uh, some other documents extrinsic to the Mitchell deal that Mitchell said he, he didn't like. Um, but some of those documents, which weren't addressed, include indemnity agreements related to the HOA's claims of money owed. Uh, hold harmless letters for the title insurance based on claims asserted by the HOA. And then specifically, uh, in reviewing the letter of the HOA's attorney, it's abundantly clear that litigation would be instituted if the HOA were not presented with these rights and provided their first refusal, referring again to those additional items. So that was what was addressed partially. Then we have uh, more evidence of the HOA's misinformation related to the Mitchell deal, saying we can get the whole thing, the whole package. When that was never the deal, the club always had essentially a put option, uh, own part of the part of it and, you know, force the buyer to buy the rest of it later. It was never to get rid of the club and it was never to uh, buy the whole thing. There's ample evidence, um, you know, emails uh, and letters that were circulated misrepresenting this so much so, and, and we know Robert Mitchell knew about this, because he had a letter sent to the HOA's lawyer saying, look at these inaccuracies that are being circulated. We need to set the record straight. Can you please send a, a correction? And the HOA's attorney said, yeah, we'll, we'll send a correction letter around. Defendant Gerritsen testified that correction never got sent around. So by the time Mitchell went to pitch the deal to the HOA membership, they were looking at him with a jaundiced eye. And they, in fact, we know they were because we have an email from a resident saying, what's the truth? This doesn't match anything we were told going into the meeting. By the way, none of this was part of the motion for summary judgment or addressed in the order below. Um, so your honors, and I'm probably running up against my time here, um, but I would just like to say that- uh, You're at 13 and a half. Thank you, your honors. Um, the initial burdens, whether or not they were met or not, we think this is a clear mandatory language, a black and white case where you, you move and you don't put in the transcripts and then you can hide what's in those transcripts. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it really brings up this, you know, the specter of gamesmanship and it then improperly shifts the burden onto the non-movement to come forward. And under the summary judgment cases uh, from the 11th circuit that we've cited, Lenten Circuit said, Celotex didn't change the fact that you can't just file a motion, a bare bones motion and say, you know, now, now show us what you got. You, you, gotta, you gotta point into the record and show, you know, what's there. And we know that they knew about all this evidence because one, we had the trial uh, exhibit list that listed it all out. Um, and second, uh, again, those very depositions uh, with uh, Gerritsen and Longenecker that they had just taken covered all this material that I've talked to you about today, your honors. And so they knew this existed and they just didn't address it and forced the burden on the non-movement prematurely. But even still, the club rose to the occasion and presented ample evidence. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reserve the rest of my time, your honors. Thank you.
Attorney Walter, uh, you may respond. May it please the court, Elaine Walter from Boyd Richards Parker Colinelli, representing Country Club of Sarasota Homeowners Association and Mary Louise Garretson. Um, trying to figure out the best place to start. So I guess I'll just start with um, the depositions because those seem to be problematic or potentially problematic. Um, as Judge Labritte stated, the rule does permit the court to look at other evidence as of record at the time of the summary judgment hearing. The court does not have to, but can. Um, I'm not sure that it makes any real difference, but the explanation to me as to why those deposition transcripts weren't filed commensurately with the summary judgment motion was the summary motion, the summary judgment motion deadline was the exact same day as the discovery deadline. Um, we didn't brief that because I think that's probably uh, not something that really matters when it comes right down to it. Um, but what is relevant is that those deposition transcripts bore out exactly what, well, exactly, but very close to what we said were in them. Ms. Longenecker stated that they left the deal because of a legal conflict, um, legal issues between the association and uh, the tennis club. The only legal issue that was currently between those two organizations was the 2016 complaint. It was about some sort of agreement the two parties had. Um, and the rest of the evidence that was relied on um, by the HOA uh, was, as the court stated in its order, speculative. As to the Robert Mitchell agreement, Mr. Mitchell uh, had his attorney send a letter and the actual reasons that they stated for not going through with the contract were new terms that were unacceptable and triggered the HOA's right of first refusal again, including an indemnity agreement, a hold harmless, um, with a uh, typically title Ms. insurance. Typically, yes, Ms. Walter. Typically, Ms. Walter. In in almost every context, causation is a fact question for a jury to consider. Even when you have multiple factors contributing to causation, why is this case an exception to that? This case is an exception to that because we have it from the mouth of the party that withdrew from the agreement in both circumstances. Well, what you have from what you do not have from those parties is, oh, it had nothing to do with anything the homeowner association was doing. You do not have that evidence. What you have is kind of a I don't really remember. There was there was some problems with the homeowner association um, that didn't seem to get worked out, and then there's all these other things. To me, that sounds like, okay, That's that sounds like the kind of thing a jury needs to, to hear and weigh and figure out whether the plaintiff ultimately satisfies their burden. But you do, well, not, have, you do not have any of these witnesses saying, no, no, it had nothing to do with this homeowner association. Well, that is true. Mr. Mitchell was never deposed, so we don't have his testimony at all. Um, your motion we, for summary, but it's your, it was your burden, though. We do have Mr. Salou saying that the association did what it needed to to protect itself. Um, we also, when it comes to the Robert Mitchell agreement, the evidence that's being cited, contrary to the summary judgment motion, is all in internal communications of the association members, or almost exclusively internal communications. It's not communications where we are contacting Robert Mitchell or other places to say, don't let this happen. Um, so that is a bit of a sort of non sequitur because how can an internal operation of an organization impact somebody else's, uh, well, be if they're, if they're, the if tortious they're, interference. If they're warranting or if they're making representations that there are deed restrictions that don't exist, that's our arguably a slander of title. So that goes back to the long, the, um, Taylor Morrison agreement. Um, uh -huh. There were two separate um, interpretations. There was one that was done for the association that said that that deed restriction did not 
um, prevent housing to be placed on the property, but it did say that it would depend how much housing could be placed on the property. I'm not sure if that is where that, what that letter was referencing or not. Um, and Again, long enough this is, this is the kind of thing juries get in panel to decide all the time, right? What um, did you mean by that? What was intent? That's, and in fact, that's, that's, we've got, um, the Howard v. Murray case out of the first DCA, it's talking about in the context of whether or not the, the conduct was justified or not, but it, I mean, it can apply equally here and where the court says these kinds of things, whether or not a defendant acted without justification is highly fact dependent, requires an examination of the defendant's conduct, its motive and the interest it sought to advance. So why isn't all of this that you're bringing out, which you're telling me, well, we can infer from it this and we can infer from it that, why isn't all of that just more properly given to a jury to sort out? I think because it goes more, it's more speculative than it is actual proof. And because we have this new summary judge judgment standard that um, it has to create a genuine issue of, issue of material fact, um, it can't be mere supposition and belief. And that is what the homeowners association is, is advancing that these uh, activities or alleged activities are more of a supposition and belief. I, I do understand your honor, what you're talking about with the, um, maybe you can't develop or we're investigating it, um, but it was, we're investigating it. We're not saying that it can't happen. Let me, let me, let me switch gears on you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's touched on in the brief. But count three, the breach of the maintenance agreement. You recall the that count, uh, it has to do with the drainage, the, where there's an express agreement. Yeah, the Homeowner Association says, um, agrees, it, and I'm reading it now, it shall not, it shall not challenge a petition for such rezoning on any drainage related issue. And then we have evidence in the record later of a um, of one of the members sending, I'll just call it, just sending ad copy to a neighboring property owner of, hey, here is how you can, here is how you can go about objecting to, you're going to have drainage issues here. Here's how you can go about objecting. Why isn't that evidence in and of itself evidence of a breach of that maintenance agreement? Or you, know, you could, you could stretch it out, duty of good faith, fair dealing. Um, what, why isn't that in itself created an issue of, of fact for the jury to decide on count three. Right, so for count three, it actually says that we cannot protest or we cannot, I'm trying to look at the exact language, Your Honor. Um, and we did I just read, I, yeah, I just read it a second ago. It's, it shall yeah. not challenge a petition for such rezoning on any drainage related issue. Right, and and a challenge. There was no challenge made by the homeowners association. They did it well because the they were trying to do. She's trying to do indirectly what she couldn't do directly, which is which can also be be a breach of contract. Whether you do it directly or indirectly doesn't matter. If if you are if you that again jury issue decide whether or not what you've done constitutes a breach. Um, you know, it's it's our position that what they alleged in the complaint was that we made a concerted effort through these forms that were being distributed and that right. didn't bear out. Um, and as far as that, those emails, um, they just, it never went to fruition as far as I can tell. And if, if it doesn't go to fruition, there's no challenge and therefore there's no basis for the breach of contract. Um, so as far as uh, the, and I, I'm not sure I need to go here, but I'm going to, um, as far as the de declaratory judgment actions, uh, we believe that the court properly um, entered summary judgment on them. Um, either way, if, if the court believes that the judici ju ju uh, justiciable controversy um, was problematic and it should have been a dismissal, uh, we still have the same result, and it would seem like a waste of judicial resources to ram remand for that particular issue. Um, and as far as uh, Ms. Gerritsen, 
I, I did want to say we raised um, that Ms. Gerritsen um, should have been protected by the statute. I understand um, we did it in our motion to dismiss and our answer in affirmative defenses. For some reason, it was left off the summary judgment motion. To the extent that the court finds that's not preserved, we will withdraw that argument. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, um, that's something that, again, could be raised below. And we honestly don't think we actually need that argument anyway, because we do believe that the um, tortious interference and the claims should be affirmed. Is there any other questions from the court? I do not see any on my screen. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm not um, trying to cut that, you off. I was just answering your question. <laughs> um, and, and with that, I'll just say uh, we would ask the court affirm in all respects. Thank you very much. May it please the court. <clears throat> just, just a few. Hold on. Let me get my high degree of technology here. <sighs> Apologies, Your Honor. That's all right. It's hard to run this little thing here, right? <laughs> Lack of skill set. No, we are ready, counsel. You have your five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, just touching on a few things that were discussed. Um, what we have from the, the mouth of the buyers, Cami Longenecker, is that there were outstanding issues between the seller and the association. And until those got resolved, and she could remember exactly what they were, but outstanding issues, uh, you know, reasonable inference is that it is the litigation. Another reasonable inference is it's those deed restrictions that kept getting brought up and thrown in their face, especially because when defendant Gerritsen testified, she spoke to Cami Longenecker. Cami called her as the president in response to the, the letter revoking right of first refusal. And Cami asked her, would you waive those deed restrictions? So we know the deed restrictions were on their mind and we know that it's a reasonable inference that those are the outstanding issues because one of the board members uh, himself drew that reasonable inference and said, quote, uh, these were, it had the expected result, the letter and the litigation had the expected result of Taylor Morrison withdrawing. So that's a reasonable inference that a jury should be able to make too if the homeowner association's members can make it themselves. Um, we also have those text messages from Robert Mitchell. He didn't testify. But gosh, we have contemporaneous communication between him and the principal of uh, the club discussing, you know, how he's kind of kind of frightened up by this this homeowner association and that they're spreading falsehoods. Right. This goes back to that that unjustified uh, interference. What was unjustified about exercising the right? Of course, of course, the homeowners association can hold a vote. Of course, they can exercise that right, but they can't do it by lying and dissembling. And, and playing hide the ball. And so the internal, the internal evidence, there's a suggestion that all, of, all the internal communications between the homeowner association is irrelevant. Well, no, it, it does go directly to the exercise of the message. Once again, we see conversations after the, the exercise of the right of first refusal. We see that they knew uh, prior to exercising the right of first refusal, that there was going to be an extension of the due diligence period, which they later claimed surprise on and used as a pretext to revoke the right of first refusal. So those aren't irrelevant. Those are clearly relevant. They should have been in the motion for summary judgment. They should have been addressed in the summary judgment motion. We provided them and they support our claims. And so, Your Honors, just to wrap up, the burden should have never shifted to us. It is a plain language that must, must point in the record to some specifics. And it, you can't leave it up to the non-movement to provide those specifics. But even so, the non-movement did provide those specifics and provided a lot of specifics. We've endeavored here for the better part of 40 minutes, wrestling with all of these facts, much of which was ignored below. Uh, Appellees have given their interpretations and their inferences and their gloss on it, but respectfully, that is for the jury to do, not the appellees. And so we respectfully request reverse and remand this summary judgment on all counts for a trial before a finder of fact. Thank you, Your Honors. This is, can I Thank just you. can I just 
uh, offer an, an observation. Given the, the existence of this right of first refusal that's out there and the fact that these parties are in just ongoing litigation, <laughs> seems like for quite a bit, it is a real pity that um, I, I don't know what efforts have been made for you all to settle this dispute globally. It's a real pity uh, that that hasn't happened yet because, you know, I'm just wearing my old practice hat. These are the kinds of disputes that, that really the parties should try to forge a creative settlement um, that, that covers everyone's economic interests. It just, it just screams out that. So take that for what it's worth. I agree, Your Honor. And unfortunately, uh, here we are. So we respectfully request uh, reversal and remand. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both. Thank that you, will Honors. conclude this presentation. And the next case can be brought over of uh, the Guaiwi and Wilmington Savings Fund. Here's all my stuff. Mr. McKillop, I believe you represent.